Right, there we go, and we are live. Hello, guys. Uh, sorry for the delay there. It it didn't end up being too long though. Um, Mr. Uh, Mr. Woe has nothing to deal with, but we're all busy people here. Well, um, but good things hello, come to yes. Those who wait. <laughs> yes, they do. Um, welcome, welcome to our regular Thursday stream, which doesn't really have a name anymore since Trig is busy doing real life stuff. Yeah. <laughs> um, I just noticed some of the some of the chats. Why didn't you show, Photoshop Evelyn onto it? Because it was me that photoshopped it, and that's too much of a self insert. Yeah, that, that's a bit cringe. Is uh, it's shooping <laughs> yourself onto things? I I say as I continuously make memes of myself as the star, but um, that's just the way it is. Yes, uh, for those of you who don't know, and it seems quite a few of you do know, um, we have a guest on today, uh, Mister Mister Millennial Woes. If you want to say hello. Hello, everyone, and thank you for inviting me on. Uh, should I, should I call you Scrump and Evelyn? Uh, yeah, I suppose uh, that's yeah. about right. <laughs> that's what people know us as. Okay, I thought so. All right. Uh, well, yeah, well, uh, thanks for inviting me. I hope this is uh, a useful conversation. Uh, I have been around for quite a long time, since t uh, 2014. So I've seen a lot of changes and people come and go. And, uh, and even the, the movement itself has evolved quite a bit in that time. I don't know if there's any need, if there'd be any benefit in going over that history, but uh, that, that's up to you guys. Uh, I think we can maybe get round to that further on. I was actually going to sort of say, I understand some of it's a bit of a turbulent story that might not want to go into entirely, but you, maybe not the nicest terms, but I, when I started watching all sorts of stuff and Sargon and you were you were always someone that was kind of on the periphery of that scene you were, for a long yeah. time you were like the you were the, like the acceptable ethno nationalist or whatever they kind of saw you as yeah so I don't really know why that was but uh <laughs> I don't know because well the the few times I uh, met Dan in person he always described you as a very mild-mannered person so I assume maybe it was just because of that but uh, mm. I'm aware some things that have happened, and I mean it's not maybe the nicest term, but you kind of had to sort of disappeared for a while, and have you've come back, and you seem to have got a big presence on Telegram, which is where I sort of bumped into you. Uh, well, there, I, I mean, the thing is, it had already been I, I had already been sort of detaching for a year and a half, uh, but, but mostly because of the censorship, hmm. and also because I was terrified of. I, I, well, certainly at the start, I was terrified because we'd been very comfortable. And then suddenly there was this threat that you're going to lose everything that you've built up. Uh, and then also uh, the, the movement itself, which was then called the alt-right, was, uh, was rudderless. It was directionless after Trump got in and it was a disappointment. Um, so, yeah, I, I didn't know what to do. And I was very stressed about it. So I had been detaching. I just couldn't really. I I struggled, really struggled to make videos uh, at that point. And uh, yeah, then then there were as some people will know there were some fake allegations that were put about, and I had to deal with that for about well, a few months, six months. And uh, yeah, it's all it's it's been a very turbulent time. Uh, that was when I mean, that was two years ago. Hmm. Um, but yeah, the, it's I mean. The movement is always turbulent and it's always evolving. Yes, that's... and there's always okay. drama. <laughs> well, we, there is. We kind of have a sort of somewhat similar story. I mean, I, I was never quite as involved as until sort of the last year and a half or so, but I was at least quite aware and I knew people that were involved in the scene and that's that next thing. And as all the sort of COVID stuff really kicked off, I was very adamant and hardcore on it right away. When it came to all the stuff that's very obvious now, but the World Economic Forum and this, that, and the next thing that we talk about to no end, and for some good reason. But I know you had the same problem as well, Scrump. That the people you were around at the time didn't want to take that seriously. No, I, I'm someone very who's been around. And... <laughs> yeah, I, I've been around in some form or another since about 2014 as well, but in kind of a a lower rent capacity. I was always people's perennial guest, and I always got lumped in with. You know, people like Sargon because he used to be on his streams and part of his uh, playing games and stuff with other people. What what was loosely described as the skeptic community. I was basically the guy they got on to, to say edgy things and, you know, uh, basically, you know, it, I became the guy who came with the streams to say nigger when no one else would. <laughs> um, and that became unacceptable at some point. Like the TOS people, people started to lean away from the edgy stuff. 
and very mm. much leaned into the terms of service. And you're yeah, right, people really it started to become people's livelihoods. Um, yes. And yes. then then as soon as it became apparent they could be removed from these spaces and the rug could be pulled out from under them, people really need to start worrying about how they interact with big tech, how they interact with certain platforms. I mean, we're on YouTube, but we're only kind of nominally here because it's we're quite small and we haven't really caught the eye yet. But I'm I'm fully aware that the rug could be pulled at any point. You know, we do mm. have a Telegram and as we'll probably move on to later, we've we've tried to run a lot more real life stuff. And so have a lot of other people, to be fair. There's been a lot of interest in transitioning this more into the real world. Um, and that's a, a, a sight of much more resilience. But no, I've, I've always kind of, not always, but I've, I've tangentially known of you for quite a long time. And it, yeah, it was that you, as, as Evelyn described, were like the the acceptable ethnet, as it were. Um, yeah. And you've, I've, behind the scenes, I've, always, I've actually always heard decent things about how you interact as a person with other people. So that's, that's at least encouraging. But the... Oh, the... Oh, someone's starting a motorbike. So the, the issue is that I think, again, a lot of people have become very splintered. And from the point of view of some of our audience, you will have just disappeared from the face of the earth for a while. And that's, well, I guess, I got, that that's happened... another thing is I got banned from YouTube. <laughs> and there are people, you know, that was uh, last February. So that's a year and a uh, quarter ago. And there are people, loads of people, who are still wholly on YouTube. Hello, they don't... Susan. <laughs> so... <laughs> Hello. <laughs> so they. They don't go to BitChute or Odyssey, and and I understand. I mean, it, it's people are very habitual. I am very habitual. It's very difficult to. Uh, it's like, well, oh, why bother and and whatever. Um, but the well, the reason why not to bother is that we need an ecosystem, mm. and it, right now it's 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 split. It's dis, it's yeah, split all over the place. Um. I mean, there, there's so much that could be said about this. But sorry, I interrupted you. You were saying that a lot of people wouldn't have heard of me. I mean, it's true. I, I see people saying, oh, we haven't heard of woes in years. I mean, yeah. it's, it's annoying. But what can I do? I mean, I'm on Telegram, very active on there. I, I put stuff on Odyssey. But this is the whole point of deplatforming. Mm. This is exactly the effect that they want when, when they, this is why they do it. Okay. Uh, it's... Yeah. It's not something I was thinking of possibly starting with, but I think it's a good inroads to it. But to, you know, one of the, what I at least think is possibly one of the key purposes of the, the distant right sphere that I would say I'm part of and interact with regularly is that we are moving ourselves into the real world. You know, we, we are having conferences, we're having networking events, you know, there is, there's going to be upwards of possibly four this year, if you include both Shielding's events and hopefully the Nomos event that we did in March and the one that we're planning to do in October. And as much as that's not us getting in the pub every weekend and having a chinwag, it does mean that we, you know, we're starting to actually build trust amongst one another in, in the real world, which is such a low bar, but it's, you know, it's at least the first hurdle that you have to actually cross. Yes. I mean, there's always been this thing about uh, when are we going to get out into the real world? We're just online. We're just it's just a talking shop. Um, the danger is uh, the, the real world is you know it's bad enough online. The the policing, the censorship, whatever, the de-boosting, the throttling, it's all bad enough online. But in re in the real world, it's physical, and. Uh, and I, I don't have much experience of this. You know, the, there are people who've been in fights with Antifa, people who've gone to prison because they defended themselves against Antifa. Uh, there are people whose events have been scuppered, so months of work just goes down the drain. Mm -hmm. uh, a, a lot yeah. of that, though, is people just being, frankly, silly. I mean, the, you know, the, the idea... There are of, lessons that can be learned. Yeah, a, you know, yeah. a dissident network of, of right-wing people is a lot more robust if it doesn't explicitly call itself either dissident or nationalist. You know, it's just, that seems to me like a complete given. I mean, I talked to my friend about this the other day where he was mentioning some of the... Uh, like I, would, I would agree. I mean, it's, it's, groups, yeah. I think, that are calling it, where they're going out and they're, you know, doing MMA or they're CrossFit or they're training. They're, you know, they're, they're getting a real network of people together and that's important, but what they then go and do is they drape it in far-right political iconography and 
you know, bring the sort of eye of Sauron upon them when they don't, you know, there's no need for it. You well, can... it's worse than that. It's that they're actually playing the role that the enemies have uh, crafted it's, for yeah. them. Yes, they're so playing too... up to it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're doing. They're they're becoming the playthings of the enemy, which is, uh, you know, <laughs> I mean, I I shouldn't be too smug about this because you know I've done it too back in twenty fifteen. Well, six, especially sixteen, um, because back then it felt like you could get away with it, and it's all. It's all a laugh. It's you know, there's ironic humor, and I, I needn't describe it now. But um, you know, I took part in that, and then because at that time we basically felt, well, it's we're invincible. We, this is a new age. Uh, we have freedom of speech. We have social media. There were some prescient people who said back then, look, you, this is not safe at all. The, the, this is not secure. They can take all of this from you. But that just seemed kind of boomerish it was uh it seemed like they were the naive one for saying something like they, they don't get the mm. the modern the way it is now but actually no they were correct well, yeah uh, because they, you they... <laughs> you can't do that we live in a liberal democracy i can say what i want police well, it's, it's not even that it's the the promise of social media itself social mm. media and you've got to remember that there were quotes from various people high up in social media corporations lauding freedom of speech like back in 2012, 2013, before Brexit and Trump. And they were saying, you know, uh, uh, and I've recounted this before, you know, the famous one is the guy at Twitter saying that Twitter is the free speech wing of the free speech party. Then the other one is a Google CEO, I think in 2012, saying we're reaching a point where censorship on the internet will literally be impossible. And he got a round of applause for that. Um, so, oh. <laughs> you know, you can understand us thinking, well, this is freedom of speech. We, this is social media. Before we get too heavy and stuff, I forgot to see the boilerplate youtube stuff. If you want to ask questions, we are somehow still monetized. I don't know how, because um, we have got a super chat in there. So you can send things like super chats. Uh, the best way to donate to us, though, is through Streamlabs. Um, we will try and read every question that is submitted. Um, also, we'll, we'll shill the Telegram because, like I said, we could basically disappear at any moment from this platform. So, if you guys want to keep in touch with us, the Telegram is probably the best way. It gets updated multiple times every day. We are on there chatting. So, yes, if you want to ask questions, Streamlabs is the best way. They take less of a cut, but you can you can give Susan your shekels if you so desire. Um, like this person seems to have uh, Jesus in spandex says uh, re IRL events, London basket events present the cathedral oh they're showing the cathedral again yeah we went to that last month uh basically some guys have started a very kind of start -y, i guess you could say dissident club almost it's yeah. just a place where people can gather once a month uh secret location in london july 15th um we went to the last one it was very good very good mix of people and that's the kind of thing i think that people need to move towards doing. Well, it's, you mentioned uh... people being silly, Evelyn. A lot of people try to do events on college campuses and essentially mm. performatively trying to do things in hostile territory. And I think that's not smart. You want to go somewhere where there is security, well, the... um, where there will be people who are, you know, are looking after a building generally. When we do events, it's in places that have bouncers. Yes. And it's difficult to have a protest when you're on a on a kind of a high street on a Friday now. You will you will get your head kicked in by a very large bouncer <laughs> if you start some shit. Uh, they're used to very violent drunk people, so skinny, mouthy leftists uh, is not usually a uh, a big problem to them. But well, yeah, anyway, we... that's that's the spiel over with. Yeah, we've been generally sort of careful of that stuff. I think the. The sort of important point from to, to drag out of that as well is that if we are to, you know, get, I think with the phrase would maybe be more meta political as opposed to explicitly political and, and sidle away from the idea of having a political party and getting influence and having people in the media just for the purpose of quote unquote awareness. If instead we actually, you know, basically create something like a cult, because if you if you are anti sort of global homo culture you are already within a that that almost defines a culture in and of itself in a certain sense so if you can pull the best people out of that and bring them into your social circle you can actually go ahead and, and develop elements of culture that people can consume that allows them to sort of move away from the monopoly of disney or whatever crap people are watching nowadays 
well, I mean, something more like, I hate to say it, but something like the Freemasons, mm. where it's a, a society of people who help each other. Yes. And, uh, and that would be, I, I mean, I don't want to go along with the word cult, you know, because that's just <laughs> asking for trouble. So, yeah, we need to create a cult. Um, but something, a, a society of people who help each other would and assist each other in you know professional realms, uh, that would be good. But the issue there, and I'm sorry to come up with problems and obstacles, but, mm. <laughs> you know, from experience. Oh, no, please do. The, the issue there is that this sphere of ours is populated by people who are not terribly cooperative by definition. It's self-selecting. Mm. Well, it's people who are uh, obstreperous, very independent, uh, do not like being told what to do, do not like being told to, right, shh. Shut the fuck up now. Stop spreading that rumour. Um, stop that beef with that person who once accidentally said something that you took offence at. You know, th th this kind of stuff is extremely difficult to control. That's why it should just be ignored. And what you should do is, you know, if, if you want to talk to people who are in positions more like ourselves, not just people that are consuming our content, you should take an, an elite section of your audience be it 100 to 200 people and basically bring those people you know as i said into the real world because once they they're with you face to face and they are interacting with one another that sort of attitude dies down very quickly it, it's, it's a, like when you know you get two dogs barking at each other over a fence and you pull the fence up and they stop barking it's like that effect <laughs> yeah uh yeah uh I, I take the point. It's uh, th this is something that the internet brings out the worst in people. That's definitely true, uh, and, and they feel like they they have the uh, well, they get away with it. So why not? Why not do it? Um, I also agree that the the only thing you you cannot control the movement as a whole or the community as a whole, but what you can do is select people from it whom you will trust in future and interact with in future. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, this is the thing where it's not like being in a public organization or being on the left. We cannot, for them, it doesn't really matter whether you trust someone or what, what is there to trust? What, what can the person do to you? Well, in our situation, that person can do a lot to you. you know, they can they can dox you, for example. Uh, they can tell your employer what you're up to. Um, so we have to be very careful. Um, and yeah, that, that, that's the that's the issue. I think it's very difficult for people who are not in this community to understand what it's like for people like us, but also people who are in this community, but who aren't public figures. They also tend not to quite get this. It's uh, it's a difficult thing to grasp mm. <laughs> if you're not in this position. Well, no, that's that's why I have hope, though, because, you know, We've, we've managed to succeed what we have so far with Nomos. We have been to Shieldings last year and we're going to go again this year. The attitude and the sort of environment there is... I mean, even if you've done very basic events, to, to have a hundred or so people in a room together and you know you're all on the same level with it, that that instantly is, you know, not to use sort of cliche phrases, but it's a massive white pill, as I think they would call it, and it's... I think it makes it a lot easier to then convince people to take on any sort of project or goal seriously. I mean, that's kind of how I've come at it myself, really, is going and experiencing something like Shielding, seeing the fact that people are putting real work behind it, and, you know, regardless of whether or not it's making them money to some extent, they are they are willing to commit themselves to that. So for me, it's, it's reassuring that, fair enough, I'm just committing my time at the moment, reading lots of stuff for almost what seems like no return, but in the grand scheme of things, I'm helping to preserve and distribute and further investigate ideas that I think are important to our circle because, you know, without the ideas, you would never get the people in an IRL sort of scene in the first place. <laughs> it sort of all goes hand in hand at that point. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what would you say are the, what's the point of people meeting IRL? Because uh, it's not, I mean, obviously building trust is between people is a very worthy goal, and that's a good mm. purpose, but, I mean, what else? Well, just, I mean, well, even in the... We're dying from scratch, really, yeah. is the problem. 
Um, <laughs> it's, it, there isn't, <laughs> there isn't, yeah, there isn't that trust there yet. There isn't that familiarity there yet. And a lot of people are like, well, how do we go from you know A to B to C to D? It's just like, well, we need to go from A to B first. Mm. We need to have a real presence of people who know each other, and when things go wrong, can actually help each other. That is a big thing. It's a big thing to have a, a oh, support network. Is. Yeah, um, and it's, it, it doesn't exist yet, but the ideal trajectory would be that you, you are able to coalesce this group of people into some kind of community who are able to be online and in real world and be able to communicate effectively, run events, talk to each other, share ideas, know each other, you know, trust each other. And then from those people, you will naturally get people who show off different skill sets. There are people who can do audio visual stuff, like we saw with the cathedral stuff. There are people who can run events, there are people who can, you know, talk about art, talk about literature. And what you get from that is a vanguard of people. You get natural leaders who emerge out of a community. And you get, you know, people who fit into different roles. You can get the, div the division of labor there. Again, it's very basic. You get people together, they do division of labor, but it, it hasn't happened yet. And that's kind of the, it's a slightly frustrating part that it, you have to take it one step at a time. And again, from that group of people, you can start doing more things. One of the things I've, I've talked about is the complete lack of things like right-wing NGOs. A lot of people don't think that we can do that kind of activity, but I think we can. The example that I talked about, and they, obviously you're going to the Mises Institute next month, Evelyn, but there... Mm a long-standing example of a of a US nonprofit who is very explicitly dissident and anti-establishment and has a lot of interesting people associated with it and they they kind of form a model and there isn't really anything like that they again they're more difficult to form being against the regime but it it hasn't fully been tried and i've i've spoken to people who are more moneyed who are interested in this stuff and they've been burned by things like ukip and the brexit party and they effectively feel like they've thrown their money away but demonstrating a community of people who can put on events, who can be, you know, put on a suit, be respectable, make conversation, naturally attracts those kind of people. And you, you start to meet some very interesting people very quickly doing that. Uh, yeah, of course. And, you know, I've, I've made quite a few friends from actually meeting them at IRL events. Uh, there's no doubt that it's useful. I'm just wondering, cause I, and I don't want to, Domineer this stream. I'm, I'm just asking questions that occur to me. Um, no, no. So I guess I mean the, the the real question is what is it all for? What are we building towards? Um, I mean to me it's uh, th th there are you've got to first talk about the original thing. For, well, for me, I, I came into it in 2014. There are people who've been in this a lot longer than that. But if I talk about the original thing. For me, my channel was just literally asking questions and investigating questions and hoping to meet like-minded people. I just didn't want to be alone. I didn't want to be the only person who had these concerns about the world and had to rant to whoever was next in my vicinity. And it was people who weren't amenable to that. So I wanted to meet like-minded people. That was the point. Then 2015, Trump mania started, Brexit mania started. 2016, those things bore fruit. And that, and the alt, the alt right was a sort of idea space at first, you know, from like 2012, I think the alternative right website was started. And uh, there was Radix. And that it was a, a right wing, it was a new way to be right wing that wasn't neocon and it wasn't uh, neo Nazi. It was something thoughtful and original. And I liked it then. But then in 2016, that got sort of supplanted or taken over by Trump mania, which was much more lowbrow, much more um, simple and simplistic. But it was also much more upbeat and optimistic. So it was exciting. And people felt like we could literally, OK, the West, the West doesn't have to die. We can actually save it. We can actually you know, uh, seize victory from the jaws of defeat mm. you just didn't trust the plan hard enough well yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's well that's the thing he got in and then he messed it all up um and you know we can speculate about about why he messed up but that's beside the point so then so then it changed again and and then COVID happened 
I mean, we could talk about that interim period, like 2017, 18, 19, but there's not really that much to say. It was just sort of inaction. Mm. And then COVID happened. That brought a whole new angle in. And as uh, Evelyn said earlier, it, it, it split a lot of people. You know, a lot of people didn't want to, they wanted to talk about race and the JQ. Uh, but then there's all this globalist stuff and it sounds like conspiracy theory and whatever. But then to some people, including myself, it felt like, well, this is this is something new to talk about. This is new intellectual ground, and it's interesting, and it's also important. It really matters. So even if it sounds kooky and conspiracy, it, it you've got to just bite that. You've just got to grasp that nettle because this stuff matters. Um, and then two years on from that, we're sort of again a bit listless because the agenda, the agenda twenty thirty, just rolls on, and no, but it's very, very difficult to grasp what exactly is, what any particular thing means. Like, what does the Russia-Ukraine war mean? Mm. You know, it, you it's, said it's about difficult. COVID there, though, the point Charlie means making the chat, or I think roughly the similar point I was thinking of is that I think a lot of us, especially over the period of 2020, came to a realisation, you know, maybe prior to that you were, you're, you're searching around this sort of scene because ultimately you feel kind of lost. You're looking for somewhere to belong. You're looking for ideas to associate yourself with because there's a large part of just being a person for the most part. But on a grander sort of scale, I think a lot of us realise that you know, we, we must form a co coalition of people who at the end of the day are willing to win. Because if we understand if we don't win, that, that it doesn't, you know, what we are doesn't exist anymore. In a certain sense, we are... You know, and and a lot of the terms are uh, frankly pathetic guys, but we are the last sort of vague notion of any sort of reactionary, dissident, and frankly radical version of right wing thought that exists on the planet. The the first thing he talks about is that people do need to deatomize themselves, mm. and it can be disheartening, but it is the whole point when we talk about what is the purpose of the distant right. Really, it is to keep that flame alive. Mm. You know, as as a as like a backstop point, is to keep those ideas alive. It's to not be completely crushed, as as kind of miserable as that sounds. That really is like the very very basic of it is to is to survive, for the ideas to survive, for the spirit to survive, for all of that to survive. So it can, when it's needed, and when the, you know if should the opportunity present itself, is able to create. A different world that's a very high-minded goal i remember you you talked about shieldings but panama Hat's speech about that was you know he talked about spain and the moors and like the the multi-generational project to kind of re-christianize spain by them and that was something that took hundreds of years but they did it and his whole point was that even if we don't see fruit even in our lifetimes that it's worth the effort you're, the effort is worth you're it. planting the seeds and the, the yeah. hope is that once you once you've preserved the ideas, you can spend time building up the resources so that when the time comes, everything is there for the people who need it and maybe are more uh, a men of action type. Yeah, I, I definitely agree that the, the, the first and most important thing here is to keep the pilot light on mm. for what for what we called Western civilization, but whatever, you, the European spirit, whatever you want to call it. Um, I definitely agree with that. It's it's scary to think that there are actually people who would want to extinguish that. I mean, it kind of underlines how crazy the situation is. Mm. Well, that's that's what I mean. Though. You know, once you once you really realise that the people you're up against aren't just wanting to ruin your video games because they're stick close, that you know, at, at some point, the, the whole machine comes into full view, and you realise that from feminism to you know i don't even feel like it, racialism and lgbt rights and all these different issues compound from the same organizations that are involved in the, the same sort of procedures and covid and nudge units and you realize that for what it's worth 21st century society is designed to eradicate europe for what it's worth really in any meaningful sense and that we are up against every single aspect of it. but that once you you know, at some point you just accept that, and it's that's the battle we fight, I suppose. Well, there is a purpose as well to have it be more of a pipeline. Mm. Um, again, not to preempt some of the stuff you're going to say uh, 
in a couple months. But there's there are a lot of people out there who are quite confused and, and rudderless. You're right, but I I don't know. I I haven't felt confused for the past couple of years. Hmm. The the COVID thing has put things in sharp relief. It's been a big yes. filter for some people, and it has really put you know put the the fire under those of us who really can see that this you know the, the gap is narrowing yeah the opportunity it's... is is shrinking yeah. that the net is closing you know the the panopticon's being built as it were well, yeah, I think, we yeah uh, we are reaching it... a new kind of a new era morgoth described you know at some point the kaleidoscope stops moving and all of a sudden you see an actual clear image of it all and it all comes in in one <laughs> big picture all of a sudden and it's like ah right it makes sense well fair enough that's how it is then yeah, and I think this is what this was part of the head fuck of COVID, because you, you know, up until then we'd thought, okay, the it's a certain tribe and they want to race mix white people out of existence. Um, but COVID showed that it's actually a lot broader than that. Mm. I mean, they, and I'm not, I'm not trying to downplay. That that is happening, or that it matters. Of course, it matters, and yes, it is happening. But the uh, but it's much broader. It, it's like they literally want what what to any normal person seems like a cyberpunk dystopia. I mean, it, it's amazing, really. Um, the the stuff about the pod. I remember that being talked about before COVID, and everyone, you know, it was like extreme conspiracy kooky territory. But now it's pretty much it's in, it's on the BBC normal. It's, yeah, it's yeah. what normal people consume in the media, and it's the stuff, you know. As you say, like Alex Jones twenty years ago was talking about, oh yeah, they'll use a use a experimental disease to create a global pandemic and walk in the martial law state and cyber security and this that and the next thing. And even as you say, there there have been people three four years ago listening that scratching their head going, ah, that'll never happen. And, here we are, you know, people are actually celebrating the fact that this is where we have arrived to. And yeah. we're, f- maybe yeah, we're we further need... along than I thought we would be. Mm. And maybe we are from a bit of a different perspective. So for us, you know, I, I was always aware of the, the question of a certain tribe, but it was never my central focus. And I never quite grasped the, the people who that was their only thing. And I'm very happy to sort of extend a hand and and converse with people who have that as a concern. I mean, that doesn't bother me. It's just, you know, as you said, if they didn't come to the realisation in 2020 that there is more to it than just the JQ, there is more to it than just the black and white issue, or there's more to it than just LGBTQ policy. It's the whole big mechanism. It's, you know, the, the thing that I tend to find really encouraging is when people skip all that and straight away jump to, it's just the machine. You know, they just they just hate the machine, and that's that works so much better for me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it's important to state because some some people may not understand why people like me took a while. Uh, you know, I it, it took COVID to show us this, um, but the truth is that you know it, there wasn't a scene, there wasn't a movement as such, really until twenty fifteen. And prior to that, you had to uh, you had to do it all yourself. And so it was a lot. I mean, for me, getting Red Pill started in 2002 and ended like 15 years later. It took a long time. Whereas now there are people who can, you know, that's maybe 15 years. Run. <laughs> yeah. That's the, yeah, that's me. <laughs> uh, you get, well... I think you're right in that what you say is you realize it's broader than you think, you know, local man realizes things were even worse than he thought kind of thing. But a lot of people accuse us of being, accused of being blackpilled in a way. And I don't think that's the case. I, I don't think there's hopelessness in this scene, really. Um, I think there's a lot of people who, oop, I disappeared there. Sorry, I might be roboting a little bit. My uh, internet appears to be bouncing it, around slightly. It sounds it's fine, fine to me so far. Okay, okay, just just double checking. But now you get a lot of people who seem to be hopeless by when they glimpse the scale of it. But really, um, from what I've seen, it, it's it's the worse things are, the more you can do. Mm. It's it's really it's just like throw a fucking dart. Yeah, <laughs> it's, no, it, it, there's actually, so much that can be done. They make your job easier. That was something we we talked about in a stream about 
LGBT activism stuff, that one of the things that we can take away from that is that if you if you can just get the paint to peel off the surface of this big thing they've painted and they're trying to show everyone, then that's that's all it really takes. You know, you don't necessarily have to collapse the LGBTQ agenda, the BLM agenda, Antifa, all in one go. Because part of the I think the image of sort of global homo or leftism or whatever we want to call what we're up against is the fact that it spins all these plates at the same time. And I think if one of those plates were to come down, people would begin to question the rest of them on their own. I mean, we I think do have a quick, a quick donation though. Sorry, uh, Seasider has given us ten dollars for cigar money, so thank you, Seasider. Thank you very much. Stream things. <laughs> but, uh, no, I think that, that that happened with COVID. I mean, a lot of people all of a sudden very quickly started to question the NHS, and I think once once they questioned the sacred NHS, it sort of opened up all sorts of other things for. Yeah, once the NHS goes, you know, the sky's the limit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Once you lose your faith in the NHS, <laughs> it's like uh, the day John Lennon got shot. <laughs> yeah, today, today the NHS, tomorrow the ADL. Well, yeah, I know what you mean. But what what you were saying is um, raises another point. Where, yeah, you can red pill people in on specific things or in general, but. Academic agent said something a few months ago. He was on one of his um, ranting phases where he was angry. I can't remember what it was specifically that was going on at the time, but he was saying... It wasn't the abs again, was it? uh, No, it wasn't connected to that. Uh, (laughs) Something else. And uh, he said basically that the public, uh, there is no point, and he's, he's said this for some time, quite a few people have said this, Sometime there is no point trying to red pill the public. The masses, mm. are the, they're, they're never go, there's never going to be a popular revolt. They uh, just wait for the powerful, for the authority to tell them what to say and what to think and what to do. Now, I agree with that broadly. I think it's true of probably 95% of the public. Um, but the other question is well, and this is what he said a few months ago that it's really stuck with me. He said, um, the fact is that the, the elite, the global homo, have a plan for a living. They have a, an ideal for what you know, the average normal person should do, how their life should be. We don't have a rival ideal for living. And I think that's a very important thing. I mean, as much as, I, yeah, there's a fight to be had, but that's true. But then... The other question is, well, what what are we fighting for? Mm. You know, what well, is the because and this is something I've said about automation, about AI, about genetic engineering. You might not like these things, but well, you're you're. It doesn't matter how you feel about them. They're they're real anyway. And maybe we maybe our ideal is that these things should just be banned. That the AI should just be shut down and genetic engineering should just be stopped. Um, automation should be stopped and we should smash the machines. I think this is a a really legitimate pertinent question. What is it that we're actually fighting for? As much as you can say yeah, it's the Faustian spirit or the, the European spirit or whatever, but what's our our alternative? What's our rival to Klaus Schwab's pod? Uh, I mean, part of that, I think, would just be in the long, or, in the, or maybe more in the medium term, being able to demonstrate to people who are in <clears throat> this sort of crowd that you can actually live a life without being affected by all of the elements of the regime. I mean, obviously, as you say, you know, I myself am a, a fan of Uncle Ted. I quite like the idea of things like artificial intelligence and genetic engineering and certain elements not being delved into because I just don't think there's any good in it. And that that isn't necessarily a politically viable opinion. So I understand why you know you can't really turn that into your your forward messaging or anything like that. But I think you can I, still I, yeah. demonstrate to people that look, you know, I can live without GMO food. You know, I don't have to worry about employment rules because I'm somewhat self employed or I, I work with a trade or you know, it's, yeah, it's, I can definitely agree with you on that. I it's mean, it's uh, small sure. steps, but it, it's all these different small steps eventually build up into a bigger thing. 
the opposite of the pod is the village, really. Yes. I think there's... You're right, there isn't... The, and it, the problem is, it's so easy to sell. Um, I'm, I'm trying to... Again, I... I'm not speaking at Shieldings this year, Evelyn is, but I, I the the pitch that I made was an idea that I've been trying to form called it's like man in the pub politics. It's like how do you sell this to the man in the pub? And what you tell him is that, you know, you, we're not gonna tolerate the nonsense anymore. You're gonna be able to be left alone with your family to look after your family and make decisions for your family. You're not going to be forced to do all these things you don't want to do. Your life will be simpler. The world will be smaller, mm. and you all of this stuff will be taken from on top of you, and you know all of you won't be you won't be pushed in the pod. You'll be able to live in the village. You'll be able to have the you know the life that you now envy your grandparents for. Mm. That yeah. really is the positive vision there, and it, it's not that hard to find. It's not that hard to sell, and it's I don't think it's something we really necessarily all you know. There's no disagreement with that if you pitch that to someone. It's like look, we're just we're not going backwards, but what we're doing is we're just cutting off this big layer all on top of you that is smothering you. We are going to get rid of all these people on top of you. Um, not in like a communist sense, but in just like a bureaucracy sense. People did used to live in a much, much more direct way and interact with each other and live in communities. And we see that as almost like an impossible fantasy now. And having, you know, having talks to the man in the pub very often, it's the, it's the thing that most people will tell you that they miss and that they long for, especially up in the north of England. I'm just people enjoying just the, want, yeah. Because I'm enjoying the message in chat there. Uh, you'll own something and you might sometimes be happy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was looking at photos uh, of Edinburgh from uh, a few days ago. Uh, photos from like the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 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 earlier, and it's just so difficult to think that life is better now. It, it, it just clearly, I mean, obviously, in some ways it is, of course it is, but um, people looked happier then. It's really simple. I mean, it, it's you can actually just see it. There's more. There is more warmth there in in a crowd of people. Than there is today. Mm. Well, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the, the idea of a positive vision because it does sort of bring us back round to, well, we'll dig back into our bag of AAISMs. That as much as we may like the idea of, you know, selling the idea of the village or Trumpton, as it was once called, yes, that was, great controversial I I, idea, there is still the problem of the fact that ultimately a, a, a negative vision is more politically animated and that when the time comes the people that you have grouped together by a positive vision your your elite minority who you know are willing to sacrifice for something that they somewhat agree and envision you know amongst themselves they will then have to you know the the idea of clear them out that sort of coalition of just get rid of the elites We'll do the heavy lifting in public because it's it's just a more receptive message. It always is. Agitation is the uh, what is it the the role of the agitator is to truly describe the situation of things and to do it in a negative form to quote Mao essentially. Uh, well, yeah, um, I, and I guess that brings us to the the question of the difference between the the elite the. The people who are in the know and uh, and the masses, and I I do agree that the masses need a simple message. And about the thing about a negative vision is interesting because it's often said, ironically nowadays, even by people who are doing it themselves, it's often said that uh, a dictator loves to have a, an enemy group that he can point the public to and and say they're trying to ruin everything for you. And, you know, it, it's liberals love to say this, but then they went after anti-vaxxers and pe the unvaccinated uh, over that's, the last few years. It's just astounding. That's all politics, though. It's very, you get very Carl Schmidt very quickly. Yeah. All regimes need an enemy. All politics needs an outgroup. You can't do politics without an outgroup. It's impossible. And I, the, the realities of that and the the fake niceties of the world we live in now, I think most people are, uh, not most people, a lot of people are losing that illusion 
And you're right, it's not going to be a mass movement, but it's, it's something we keep saying. We don't need more people, we need better people. Yes. Um, and give, being able to have more outreach gives you a better chance of getting better people, but ultimately what you need to do is you need to filter those people. And we get back to the whole, you know, it's not going to be a secret society like the Freemasons, but it would. It might have to operate with layers of stratification and ossification like that to, for security reasons. I described it when I was asked questions about this, because I, I tried to give a little bit of this vision during my speech last year at Shieldings. I described it as somewhere between like a church... Uh, uh, like a house Bible study group and Project Mayhem from Fight Club. It's kind of somewhere between those two <laughs> extremes. Um, but that's, I, I actually said this in a room full of people. I got some funny looks, but um, that's really how I envision it. It's this quiet, boring, unassuming, you know, in, in many ways, polite radicalism. In which people are able to go out and and mingle and look normal with what they're doing, but underneath it and behind closed doors and in in the groups of people who know what's going on, they're organizing. And that's what all of these movements throughout history have done. They have had the the outward appearance. They've had the 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 wider movement, and then they've had the the kind of the unshakable uh, vanguard of the core. And that really is, you build it from that. And once you get that, and once you get the right people in place, you, you, unless you completely fuck it up, you're almost set. Um, it's, it, it's a difficult thing to pull off, though. And it's a difficult thing to pull off with such a hostile country around us, to be honest. But that, that is the dance that needs to be done. It's you know not to get not to not to talk about uh, things too in too much detail, but it's it's I know I stole you've stolen this from someone else, but the, the one big crime, as it were. It's, you, uh, yes. you, uh. Yeah. <laughs> you, you have to commit, you know, the people are sitting, clear them out in chat. You have to commit the one big crime. Yeah. But until you can, until you do, all, what you're doing is you're building and, you, and building happens incrementally. And taking a leaf out of the book of the current elites is you make a lot of it quite esoteric and boring and hard to understand, um, apart from the people who are in the know. And most people will kind of nod along, will hear things they're not quite sure about. But there's a lot of signifiers you see with like the World Economic Forum you talked about and all that is that they, if you really study them, you, you can see their in-group language. They have things that solve dual purpose to the platter, kind of like the platitudes to the public, but also the signals to their, their class, essentially. They're inside a class language in which they go, yeah, we're doing this. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I do look forward to the days of the great crime, a crime so great that it legally substantiates itself as a new government. Well, uh, yeah, I, uh, that's uh, that's daunting language. I, c I certainly uh, wouldn't want to agree with it for obvious reasons. Disavow. Um, yeah, disavow <laughs> in Minecraft and so forth. Oh yeah, this is all taking place in a Minecraft server, in an RP, in a Roblox server on on Fortnite for for legal reasons. Um, <laughs> but um, I mean, it's uh, yeah, I, I I see what you mean. I mean, I, I take the point about uh, I'll, and you know, academic agents thing about clear them out is interesting because you know, again and again, we see that those who are in positions of authority in the in the west today are either useless and incompetent or and they've been placed there because of that or they're on board and uh they're on message and and so i do i mean i basically i agree with them that, that ultimately they all have to be replaced it's uh, it's funny you know people used to say this about about immigrants you know they've all got to go back it's, uh, I think it's also true of uh, of the politicians. I mean, I was thinking, how would you, how would you overhaul the the, the British education system? Like, let's say the, the the English education system. You can't just tell the teachers, right? Okay, you've got to be less woke could. from now on. I think, um, if, I think if you if you basically nixed the upper brass and had control of the teachers' union and turned around to them and said, anyone that teaches these <clears throat> this subset of prescribed ideas is no longer getting paid and is going to be unsanctioned as a teacher, that they would probably fall in line pretty quickly. Well, you'd have to have control of the union. No, of course. I mean, that's the, that's why I, I stipulated yeah. it. It's obviously not, yeah. it's not yeah. an easy thing to do, but it makes you understand that there is actually, you know, there are 
thousands of teachers across Britain, but not to use uh, suspicious language, you would only in theory have to target a small number of those people and their possessions and delegitimize them somehow. Yeah. But see, I think yeah. COVID has the, shown that, yeah. Obviously, it's the Pareto rule, you know, of, of yeah. all those teachers, you know, the, was it the, the uh, square root of the total creates half the product and so on and so forth. Because if COVID has shown us anything, it's how malleable large parts of not only the British public, but the British apparatus is, mm. that they can change message when it comes down from above on a dime. Um, a lot of it really is about, as, as this, this, I guess this is more of a in-group conversation, but I, I don't think this is anything that's new to people, that you, you have to find those disaffected people within the establishment. You have to have allies on the inside, and they do exist. They are there. I've met some of them. Mm. Um, and they're very skittish, and they they want like proof of work first. They want you to show that you can, you know, walk before they're willing to pay you to run. If you know what I mean. There's a lot of nervousness within the British apparatus. Um, I, I can't speak for the Americans. I've not you know spoken to some of those people firsthand, but secondhand, the information I get is that there's quite a lot of the same. A lot of people who are in positions where they have to do practical functions are very very nervous about the future, they're very unhappy, and they're very receptive to a message that, like we have, more so than I think at any point since the end of World War II. It's, I, I don't know, it, it's difficult to gauge it within your own time period, but I think that is the case. And that really is, is a vector. A lot of people ask me, what do you do? Well, look at what the left does. They do everything. They have they have a tool for everything. They have an activist for everything. If you look at somewhere that a lot of people came from, something like Gamergate, they have enough activists to effectively create a culture war within video games and trying to ruthlessly police the hegemony there. Like the will. If you look at some of the stuff they do in terms of policing each other's speech, a lot of people talk about how the left purity spirals and, you know, oh, they'll, they'll destroy themselves this time. But no, they will they will destroy anybody who is not on message. And I feel like Colonel Kurtz in, uh, in Apocalypse Now, like the will, the will and the hegemony it takes for them to be able to do that. Now, I feel like I'm looking at that pile of little arms. When I see that, it's just like they they will destroy your life because you have the wrong opinion on video games. That is an extreme demonstration of power. Um, and they that is something I think a lot of people who who bit, let's say, the liberal pill wouldn't be willing to do. Because I've, I've had conversations with people behind the scenes and I've asked them, but like, look, do you think we're going to have change without people being lied to? Do you think you're never going to have to lie to anyone if you want substantive change? Like how... How but, uh, to continue the, the language of masonry, we need to have shibboleths. When I say free speech, I actually mean our speech. And when I say, you know, uh, exploitative speech or whatever figure we want to come up for that we use to attack leftist ideology, that means their speech, you know, in the very simple friend-enemy distinction. And the same with democracy. Democracy means our people in control, not theirs. And that people in our circles are not willing to do this because either they genuinely believe in the idea of democracy or they aren't willing to be Machiavellian or they're not clever enough to keep up with the game. And I, I believe that <clears throat> facilitating more and more IRL organisation will maybe not necessarily make these things successful overnight, but will make them a lot more possible and at least feasible as, as strategies to try to try out, test them, just see what happens. Because, you, you know, it, it is uncharted territory. So we might as well, we might as well have a wee experiment or two. Yeah. Um, the, I don't know, I, I actually do have an attachment to freedom of speech for individuals. But at the same time, you know, academic departments, uh, I mean, I would happily shut down academic departments. I would happily have a British Board of Film censors that censored Marxist propaganda. Um, I think there should be. Um, there, the, sorry, amazingly, there was, a, there was a time when the BBC actually vetted, up until, I don't know, the 70s, they actually vetted every employee for communism. Which you know is just astonishing now, but uh, you know it's not something that is 
totalitarian. Well, you it's, see a, it's a society looking after itself. You say that, but the chairman of the BBC right before it lost its sort of kind of almost monopoly status essentially admitted that television will now become a force of cultural subversion because we can't control the content. I uh, did also notice Samuel Gogg being clever in chat, saying might be most Machiavellian to not be so frank about being Machiavellian. But then we'd never have copies of The Prince to read. Posit you that. Well, this I'd I'd consider this a slightly more in group environment. To be honest, mm. like you you have to be willing to say to people who are in the distant right, like this, like don't buy into the niceties. You you have like I I don't think it's anything that would surprise a lot of people who watch our content but you there will come a time for outgroup rhetoric but we are small enough and we are nascent enough that you know this this can be said Let's... and if, if it means that people don't like or trust me then so be it but mm. i i think that there's not enough people who are willing to actually say the quiet part loud on the right and say look you know we we don't have these private spaces yet but we should and when we do this will be said there i mean this this really is the mild version of uh, of what a lot of people would say, especially if you talk again to the to man in the pub about it. A lot of people are very, very angry about things, and it's what they have to say is not appropriate for any kind of public platform. But uh, but we have some again euphemistic language and facsimile here, where you have to be willing to to understand the logical conclusions of what you're saying and articulate them to some degree, especially when you're talking to people who are supposedly or nominally in your group. Yeah, but I mean, this is this is the thing, though, that we're on YouTube and, uh, you know, our enemies do monitor this stuff. And you know, anything that you say can be used against you. Um, so it's not like this is just a closed shop and we, we can just say whatever. See, the thing is, the only time I've ever had a problem, though, is when something entirely unrelated to doing content online, just some random person on Instagram reported me to the police. So, you know, the only time I've ever had a problem is not because of the stuff that we've actually said on here that could in any way, shape or form be perceived as extremist or blah, 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 whatever the government would call it. No, I actually just get the police at my door for a silly joke on Twitter that was very obviously a joke and was not... Was not to you know that attack wasn't directed at me for me being involved in any political sort of thing. It was just the fact that it was a personal problem and that person didn't like me. And I think that's more the thing. If you don't go around poking the bear, and you know making it a personal issue because it's not, you know, as as the the YouTube moderators aren't scouring stuff twenty four seven to look for people to ban. I think probably more often than no, not. No, I don't. I don't mean that. They're, they're looking. Uh, I'm, you know, no. they're looking for people who are willing to mass flag someone, and I don't think you get mass flagged unless you poke the bear. It's not. I don't think it's anything particularly ban or like. I I'm willing to say this. Like I will say this to people in person. You mm. you have to be willing to extend the same unfairness they extend to you. This is the kind of rhetoric they talk about openly you know you have to be intolerant to intolerance from Re our point of view they're the, is, uh, yeah, we're, they're the intolerant people so really we're we're the real liberals here because we're getting rid of the intolerant you can't you can't tolerate the intolerant people carl carl popper told me that it's it's neoliberal canon if anything i'm just being a good neoliberal yeah and uh, yeah I, I see what you mean um look it's it's a matter of uh, keeping your powder dry. I I don't I, I don't think it helps necessarily. They are it can be hazardous to say things that uh, will only scarpe you later on. Um, the, but the yeah, as I said, if I were emperor, um, yeah, there are things that I would do. I mean, there are there are departments I would shut down. Um, that there are. And there are journalists and academics who I think absolutely should not be on TV because they're they're just subversives. I mean, they're just there to break things. Down. They're not even they're not even real academics in the sense that we used to mean that word, uh, or or reporters or journalists in the way that we used to mean that word. They're um they're activists. So from that point of view, I mean, they're all political uh, competence. Uh, 
So, yeah. <laughs> no well, it's, I, I think really as, you know, the purpose of the distant right, we have to be willing to identify and be open about who our enemy is. And to, uh, there's a lot of allies we can gain, you know, not upon a popular movement sense, but in terms of finding the right people. I, you're right, we'll never have that magical 51%. We're never going to win an election. I think people are delusional who think that this can be voted away. But you have to point to all the people who are in charge, making people miserable, and go, these people are our enemies. We do not like these people, and these people shouldn't be in power. Absolutely. I mean, anyone who say, who goes on TV and says things like that, there is no such thing as male and female, or Cheddarman was black, and therefore this negates any right of the British people to their homeland. Uh Again, if I were an emperor, they would never be on TV again. I mean, you know, I do understand the need to control, to to limit subversion. Um, but at the same time, I do believe in freedom of speech. I think it's, just a, it's a matter of human dignity. I mean, we had freedom of speech up until like 2005, really. I'm we had unhampered really sure freedom of speech. That's true, because I happen to know about a certain man called Sam Francis who got cancelled as early as the 90s. And a certain man in called America. Francis Parker Yockey, who was uh, essentially possibly killed by the CIA for his opinions, So Yes, yes. But even then, they still, uh, of course, in, in those particular situations, and then, you know, Mosley got imprisoned <laughs> during the war. Um, but those are extreme examples. You know, ostensibly, the, well, the, the country practiced and believed in freedom of speech. The sovereign is he who declares the exception. If they are able to say that, some aspect of right-wing ideology is all of a sudden exceptional and no longer acceptable within civil society, as Hillary Clinton tried to do with Trump voters and the Republicans by saying that, you know, it's no, you know, these people do not deserve civility. They are, you know, they're, they are just engaging in pure politics and we need to be comfortable with doing the same to a certain extent, even if... Yeah. Even if that's it's, not... it's funny you, you say that. It reminds me of something Sargon said a few months ago. He said that... Uh, nationalists should be exiled from polite society so it's you know it's not just hillary clinton it's it's well, sargon when, as well when did he say that <laughs> one, one of his uh one of his lotus eater videos i'll have to i'll have to bring that I, up in uh, august when we see him he's he's yeah. a changed man unfortunately uh i don't know i having been in those circles and now having been kicked out of those circles for very silly reasons uh I, 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 yeah, that doesn't surprise me. I don't, people seem to vacillate between opinions depending on what is and isn't popular. And we need to be comfortable with a degree of radicalism. We need to be comfortable with people saying, like I said, that that's, you don't extend the same courtesies to your enemy that you do to normal people. Yeah. You, you, can't, you can't treat the people who do not believe you should exist the same way you would treat, you know, what would what what would be considered really a political non-combatant. And it's not a large amount of people. That's what I hate about a lot of the democracy rhetoric. It pitching populations against each other. I think a lot of the elite theory stuff that AA talks about and a lot of the stuff that we talk about is an antidote to that. And really there is only a very small sliver of British society that makes these decisions and puts these things in place. It's not your average Labour voter or even really your average activist who's Lie, you know that is, those are the misguided people, but the people at the apex, I don't feel uncomfortable saying that those people are evil because they are. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I mean, the, the rest of them are really just following orders, to coin a phrase. But what you say about democracy is interesting as well, because I mean, our enemies would laud democracy and say that we are being anti democratic What we're saying now is anti democratic, but. But they have said the very same things about us, that we should be banned from here, banned from there. Um, and then democracy itself is, is not what it's supposed to be. It's not, it's not you know, the, the label on the tin is not what is actually inside it. Um, the, the, so again, you come back to this thing about power. It really is. It, and I, this is what COVID brought to the fore. It, nothing really matters except power. And whoever is powerful dictates, uh, you know, authors the narrative and dictates how people will feel about the narrative. It's as simple as that. Well, that's, and so, I was yes, sorry, the, there, is, there is an avenue of opportunity there because there are things the regime will not deal with because it has blind spots that we would like to cover up. And there are almost sort of, you know, 
I, I can I can hear my uh, more libertarian self many many years ago cringing at this idea, but there is actually spaces for more governance, and it's governance that we could uptake and engage in more locally, and that you know we we can't even really say whether or not that's that's going to be the the effective strategy, but if you know if you can take your IRL network and then start using that to fix problems in your local community, then. Surely that's got to be worth something more than what we are just now. Especially if the messaging is all the same. You know, if you have 40 or 50 villages across the UK where all of a sudden you have solved, you know, one sort of certain social ill that we have decided we want to rid of and that the messaging for removing that social ill has been similar on board across all these different villages or towns or whatever, you know, that's not going to go unnoticed. Yeah, I mean, the most obvious example that springs to mind for me is uh, about the Pakistani child grooming. Mm. You know, that's a problem that, and I, again, I'm paranoid about saying something that gets me uh, into legal trouble here, but that seems like an issue that could be addressed legally, oh, yes. peacefully, by a committed bunch of guys who could just you know, keep an eye out on these neighborhoods in in numbers, safety in numbers, and just prevent these uh, hookups from ha from happening. And and you know that would be that would have an effect both both immediately, but also more generally. It's not something that they would ever be allowed to do is the problem. And again, talking about messaging and selling this, Ooh. if we are the the masses, don't need to be on side but they have to at least be placated they have to at least not get in the way well, see, the... i think a lot of people having this stuff removed it takes a lot of effort to stop communities being able to police themselves and each other well, well and there is a lot of effort put into doing that that's the point i mean this is why i said it could be done legally and peacefully i'm not talking about uh, no i know i harassment mean, or it... violence I, i'm saying that literally you could just do exactly what i've just described um but as you say I mean, you say it wouldn't be allowed. Probably it wouldn't. But at the same time, that that's... That's good for us. It hasn't been tried. Well, no, th yeah. even then, that's good for us, because then you would have... You know, it, it would seem untoward as to... You know, well, why do people in this region need this extra neighbourhood watch organisation? And, and why is the government shutting it down if it's just a neighbourhood watch? I think, you know, as much as you would have people celebrating that you're quote-unquote, I don't know, racist, Islamophobic neighbourhood watch organisation was getting shut down. You would have another subset of people who live in communities that deal with similar problems and maybe even sympathise with what you were trying to do. Maybe replicate it themselves. And through yeah. that you're actually creating more dissidents without even having to spread highfalutin ideas or a political form. You're, you're literally just spreading the, the notion that we won't accept this anymore and that you and your local community should do something about it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I mean, a hundred years ago, that is what would have happened. Well, a lot more than that would have happened a hundred years ago. Mm. Um, and uh, and the problem would never have manifest. It, it just wouldn't be what it is now. Uh, I, I think a huge problem, and I see it in the movement as well, but especially uh, just in the in, in the white, well, especially in Anglo peoples, is the individualism. Because a lot of guys will just think, well, okay, I could do that. I could take part in this. But, well, why should I? They're not my sisters. They're not my daughters. Um, I'm not sure about... I, this is a problem. because I bring it up because I, I see how prevalent this characteristic is in our people. Uh, something I've noticed is people are very... Um, even collective, even people who advocate collectivism are very individualistic. They're all egotists, and, that's why. I mean, well, I... they're animals. I mean, they they'll do what is good for them. It's this mm. the pleasure principle, the self improvement, whatever. Um, and this is why, ideally, uh, things should involve you know wages, people being paid. Uh, this goes for all sorts of political activism. Uh, I've talked about this on my own uh, show quite a lot. And again, the you we can learn from our enemies here. They. <laughs> They have people doing this stuff twenty four seven, um, you know, all of their activism, and uh, you know, Scrump mentioned at the start about people making a living from 
content creation. But that is the whole. And if you're not making a living from it, then you can be fired from your job. And if you're not making a living from it, then you have to do a job, which cuts down the amount of time you can spend on this stuff. So I wish that we could emulate our enemies. Yes, we need and, a we need a model yeah, of an patronage. Activist. And I think that's mm-hmm. something that's possibly... Maybe things like Subscribestar and Patreon are maybe not the ideal. And I'm not necessarily totally convinced that that gab pay thing is a solution either. But, you know, as, as we just continue to try and trial out and maybe even have people engage in patronage in a more, you know, real life form where you're actually, you know, you're dealing with someone who's going to support your work over a period in terms of investment and it's a bank transfer. So you don't have to worry about PayPal or nonsense like that. You know, you could even go and take it out and put it on a silver or cash or whatever if you're you're concerned about your bank being shut down. We just need to, you know, the more robust we can make the network, the more we can achieve and the, the bigger sort of goals we can take on and ultimately the bigger the risks we can assume. Yeah, yeah, I, I absolutely agree. And so the, the first step is to build as a, a solid and stable a foundation as we possibly can. You know, the the most reliable people, the most capable people. Um. Yeah, and, and people who aren't going to you know, fuck things up for personal gain. It's a it's a difficult line to tread, and we talk about science good on paper, but where I'm not under any illusions about how difficult this will be. There, I think there's a lack of in the early days. You talked about 2015. You talked about the, you know, the the slow process of red pulling you went through, and the the collapsing of various different nascent movements. But a lot of people who were part of the circles I was in, um, none of them really had any experience in the private sector. None of them had really done proper jobs, for a better term. A lot of the people who are just kind of laying around on the internet, that's another problem of the internet, is that they are internet people and they, they don't exist in the real world and they don't have a lot of real life skills. And to build something like this, you're going to need a lot of people who have experience in the private sector, a lot of people who have a lot of different skills that the the very online content creators we tend to rely on too much don't have. It's going to need a real pivot in mindset for people. Uh, a real pivot into a hard graft, as it were. It's not going to be glamorous. It's not going to be fun a lot of the time. It's going to be very, very hard work. But we need to find and foster people who are absolutely committed to this, that it will define them and be their life's work and that they're willing to sacrifice for it because it will take a lot of sacrifice. And that's, I think that's the purpose right now is to try and f- again forge these people. We, we're coalescing into community, it feels, right now. There's a lot of, it's nice meeting people we've talked about. It's nice having rooms full of people who are starting to number in you know, the low hundreds these days who are not only, you know, heard uh, I don't like the feminists or I'm not, you know, I'm not quite sure about this COVID thing or I want Brexit. It's who are immersed in the ideas and who are quite far along whatever whatever pipeline there is that's cobbled together uh, and having people who know what they're talking about and who are passionate is great, but it's, it's just a step along the, uh, the, the road really. And uh, there needs to be a lot of realism and a lot of growing up that goes on, I think, within mm. what is nascently known as the dissident right. And we'll probably lose quite a lot of people along the way with that. Well, you know, Alinsky said that activism should be fun. And I think that's uh, that's something that we could remember. You know, if it's all if it's always you know hard graft and sacrifice, you know, people talk about uh, various leaders saying that you know, I can offer you blood, sweat, and tears and toil. Uh, yeah, it sounds nice. It's kind of cutesy, but the reality is people get exhausted quickly. Oh, they do. And and where so possible, it, it should be fun. Yeah. Yeah. It it really does have to. You have to remember you're dealing with human beings. And uh, yeah, that's that's part of it, you know. Again, I think Alinsky, <laughs> we could learn a lot from from his stuff. Uh, another one would be you know making the enemy live up to its own standards, but I guess that's harder for us because our enemy doesn't give a shit about its own standards. Yeah, they don't have any. <laughs> no, they don't have any. <laughs> the the point I was getting at though is there is there's a lot to be done. 
and it is you know at points it is going to be it's not all going to be hardware but at points it is going to be but yeah uh, that's that's one of the best things i think that you know we mentioned saga and the saga never said is make them you know take from alinsky take from the left but they start to get a bit nervous when you start taking from people like lenin who understand power very well <laughs> That's the uh, the quote from Rothbard, I believe it is, that his, his final summation from reading bookshelves full of Lenin was that you should be uh, steadfast in principle, but ultimately as flexible as you can in regards to tactic. Yeah, that, that seems right. Don't be autistic about, uh, about how things are, about how you get things done, just get them done. Uh, yes. Yeah. I've seen this a lot where, you know, people will fall out over something that really doesn't matter and as a result, not get anything achieved. You know, I've seen it many times. It's definitely a, a thing. Where where would you ideally, like, what what do you think, and not to put you on the spot, is your kind of encapsulation of what you would like the purpose of the distant right to be? What What, what is your vision? I think that my time is... Probably approach. Yeah, you know, I, I think I'm not gonna be in this for ever, um, because I feel worn out with it. I feel like I've given everything that I can to it. So I don't like dictating or saying that this is how it should be. Um, and I'm painfully aware that I've I'm tired, right? So I don't want to contaminate people who are uh, more energetic with my weariness. Um, all I can, I think, the best thing I can do is warn them of dangers. Well, I was going to say, with that, with that world weariness comes quite a lot of wisdom. Well, I would like to hope so. <laughs> I hope it hasn't all been in vain. Um, and and I also know a lot about the types of people who are attracted to this stuff uh, because I've you know I've worked with them and I've talked to them endlessly over the last um, eight years. So. I think I can be useful there. But as for what I would want it to be, it's, as we said earlier, building a base for future generations is something that they can actually rely upon. Uh, something that is independ as independent as possible from the mainstream, but is also interacting well, with I think the mainstream. A positive takeaway you can take from that as well is that the, the tiring stuff is being on social media all day doom scrolling it's you know reacting to stuff and i mean we all yeah. do it i mean i, I sit and do it <clears throat> I'll be honest, quite i religious. discourage i actively discourage people from doing that because you know once you know the situation once you know how bad everything is okay now you know well, don't keep rehearsing it I, don't I, keep i like to do it, it at least for the you know if it's a throwaway thing on telegram and i'm spending 10 minutes of a day doing it it's really no it's it's no biggie at the end of the day but that's not what builds the movement you know, what builds the movement is the stuff that happens a few times of the year when everyone gets together and, you know, there is a room full of us talking for hours in person because that's where connections are made, that's where plans are made. You know, at the, at the last NOMOS event, our sort of, I, I shall say, friend Panama Hat managed to get someone who's going to fund his recent magazine or his new magazine he's going to be doing. So, you know... Things are things are coming together, and I think maybe the problem a lot of people have is that they just don't see it because they aren't involved in it. I think if people, you know, if you keep your eyes peeled for stuff in the real world, I think you're going to start seeing signs of us showing up, possibly quicker than some people might expect. Yeah, I hope. Well, I hope so. Um, another thing that I would say is we should be trying to come up with an, as I alluded to earlier, an ideal for living. To use that phrase, we should have some sort of notion of what we actually want the world to be like. Mm. Um, the negative stuff, that's all very well. We don't like this. We don't like that. Fine. But what do we like? Well, uh, and I'm not saying I'm not asking you now. I'm just saying <laughs> well, this is an essential thing because well, we need to know. We need to know. I might as well mention what I are mean, we doing here? I think yeah. one of the things that I started talking to you about was that I asked you if you want to be part of the NOMOS event in October. And the, the the subject was, you know, what do, what do we really want? And I think that, you know, first off, that's also a very personal question. But, you know, if, if we're actually willing to sit down and, and, you know, give some speeches and have 
80, 100 people in a room sit there and talk for a few hours amongst themselves in a serious fashion about what do they really want. That's going to put us in a lot better stead, you know, stead from where we are just now. As you say, you, you know, you're not just building the, the base of organisation, you're building the, the base of ideas and the vision that holds it together. Yeah, definitely. I mean, to speak more practically, I think one thing that could be done or should be a, attempted soon is to have a cadre of lawyers mm. because yes. I mean, I, I think that's the first thing. I mean, before you have any, Actually, the, yes. the, before you have an activist organization or a think tank, you need legal support. And, of, you and need bail obviously, money. <laughs> exactly. You need to get that. You need to have the lawyer who knows how to interact with such and such organization, whether it's PayPal, Patreon, YouTube, Twitter, um, what at Facebook, Instagram, whatever it is. And now you could say, well, but they, those are co corporations are too big. They don't give a shit. Yeah, you're right. But we need to start making them give a shit. Mm. You, and you, something, yeah, yeah, something we were talking about the other day. Yeah. yeah. So, go on. so I, I think that, and again, I know how difficult it is. I know, <laughs> believe me, I, I've, I've received the emails uh, from these corporations. I know what they're like, you know, telling you that, uh, the platform you built, the channel you built, it's gone now. Fuck off. Signed YouTube. It's it's not nice. And it's a black box. No one knows what's going on behind the curtain. But we have to start fighting back in that way. And I think that it's a, a problem. And again, this is why a cadre of lawyers would be the solution. A problem is that whenever one of us runs into this situation or any other legal situation, uh, he's on his own. He's starting from scratch and he has to do everything on, on his own or maybe get a, a friend to help. But again, it's a pair of amateurs who don't know their arse from their elbow when it comes to legal matters. So again, we need professionals who are doing this all the time, who know about this stuff. And uh, it would be a lot easier. I mean, if we could just say, right, this person's been, that this high profile account has been shut down. We need it back. So to send that to the team of lawyers and they can work on it, um, that would be ideal. But we need the team of lawyers. And probably it needs to be a team of lawyers in each country. I mean, we're talking about an international community here. Um, you know, th this would, I think, be the first step because lawfare is how they can get you every single time because we don't have any uh, defense against it we don't know what, i mean as i've said uh, we're all amateurs in, in legal matters but also we don't have the money to pay a lawyer a lawyer will give you a consultation for free but he won't do anything else for free so uh this i think is is number one uh priority and then with that stability oh, yeah. uh, you could be well, like to not a based one upwards. like one of the uh, for example just an you know, example of this from my I, own experience like, wikipedia you know, my wikipedia so page is dreadful <laughs> and of anime it's, account. it's not a only base, bad thing right wing anime account and but, uh, yeah, I, it's very select so it it or selective so it's painting a particular picture not there is nothing good about me there so anyone who looks at that who doesn't know me is going to think fucking hell this guy is evil now it's all bullshit it's it's twisted it's it lies by omission and whatever but i cannot get that with i mean i know from there's a i wouldn't name who it is but there, there's a high profile figure whose uh wikipedia page was it had uh slander it was lies on it for the best part of 10 years that's how long it took him to persuade wikipedia to fix this now it shouldn't take the best part of a decade for one of us. I mean, if if uh, if I don't know, like Owen Jones, if his Wikipedia page had something on, if it were, if if this, he he would know how to deal with it. He would have a team of lawyers, or his agent, his handlers, whatever, would know exactly what to do. Well, then it's, we it's we need actually. to be in that position. Someone someone would already there was already an organisation that would come to him in that moment, and I think that's maybe more of the sign of what we really need is <clears throat> yeah exactly there are probably i mean i don't know but there are i know at least people who watch this very stream who are very knowledgeable about law and this is no way uh dig on them because they are they're sitting there doing nothing but 
you know, if you even if you had a handful of people who weren't necessarily lawyers per se, but were at least up on the required sort of lingo and cases and precedents, that they could proactively spread that stuff around and deliver it to the people who need it there and then. That would at least be a start. The again, the what I talked about earlier was the, the fact that we don't have things like right wing NGOs. And lawyers are what a lot of NGOs do very, very well. And they do it in a way that it's basically tax free. That's how able that's how they're able to get and keep that money is because they have this nominal charitable status and they're able to manipulate the system to their own benefit. Things, you know, like things like the Open Society Foundation, things like the, you know, the the Blair Institute, things like that. And that's a very clever way of doing things. What they do is very smart. We need to learn lessons from those things. Like it's funny you mentioned that because it's I, I we're gonna split it up into different bits. But I I recently just wrote out a model. It's literally just called how do we make successful distant organizations. And it's it's a bit long in the tooth. It needs to be broken into different bits. But I think legal help and stuff from the private sector is one of the biggest things that I got. You need people. It's, legal help is a very good basis. That's the first thing you need. But you need people who are in the business community who can help you start businesses. You need people who can give you solid advice and possibly even things like seed capital. You need a lot of the stuff comes from non-political models. You need people who are good at law. You need people who know things about property. If you're going to have to have offices, you need a, a, a huge coalescence of non-political skills in place. If you're going to build this, you know, the distant right into an actual set of, of resilient organizations You've, you and decentralization. Own, yeah. You need your own yes. non-ruling elites, as it were. You need your own yes, you do. managerial people who, I mean, one of the things I, I think you could you could sort the whole, you know, distant right sphere instantly if people just knew their place, and that goes that goes <laughs> for all of us. Don't get me started. No, no. But I the know. the uh, the point the, the the important thing is that this is something that could be done now. This is something tangible. Mm. Um, and I, and I actually wanted certain higher profile. Uh, content creators with much bigger followings than me, I implored them to do this, but they just weren't interested because, again, the individualism, you know, I'm all right, Jack, I don't need this, so why should I do this? And, you know, thus we all fucking fail. It's marvellous. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I, they, they need to put out the call for lawyers who are prepared to do this stuff regardless of the potential damage to their reputations. Having, having said that, from what I can tell, it actually doesn't do much damage to lawyers' reputations because lawyers understand that lawyers do all sorts of work. Lawyers don't shark lawyers. It's like an inside thing. It's uh, it's kind of interesting that world. The there's this map that was brought out in maybe 2018 about the alternative influencer network. The in the leftist mind, we are much more powerful than we are. In fact, they have to erect this giant boogeyman straw man to make us look more powerful and more scary than we are. And they created this entire thing. There's this, this massive web of content creators who all help each other and appear on each other's streams and have each other's back. And it, it doesn't exist, but you know, it, as, as you said, Evan, it shouldn't exist, but it does. I'm, I'm kind of jacking your thing. Yeah, here. Don't, don't blow um, my spot up. I'm, <laughs> I'm, still I'm not, on but that. it's, 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 there isn't this on-ramp. There no. isn't these people who are there at the lower end who, in a very Machiavellian way almost, are trying to bring people in and bring people onto a pipeline. You know, there there, there isn't a right-wing radicalization pipeline. Yeah, where's there, the, where's there the needs distant to be right one. Jacob's ladder? Yeah, there, there needs to be one. We people need to think about this. And for that to happen, you're right. There needs to be lawyers, business people, NGOs, ground level activists, meeting places, premises, you know, in groups, out groups, multiple layers of organization. And it's it's all gonna take a lot of time, but it's all organization building is organization building at the end of the day. And a lot of it is very nuts and bolts. And really the purpose of the like I said, the purpose the distant right really should be we talked about preserving itself we've talked about the lofty stuff but we've not talked about the stuff in between which is that slow growth upwards but yeah to, to not be completely struck down we do need either lawyers the business people the money men and we need to be willing to go into bat for each other mm. in a uh, and form a proper community and that really can only be done as a first step by knowing each other and trusting each other 
I suppose we're getting on a bit here, time-wise, and getting round to the point where we'd like to normally sort of finish off. So, I don't know, is there any other, I don't know, is there any other glaring potholes we've not mentioned that spring to your mind? Uh, no, I think the the as I said earlier, you can control the whole movement or the whole community. All you can do is pick and choose which people to trust and to work with, and. Uh, with those people, hopefully you can build something, but it is risky, it is dangerous, and the more legal help we have in that regard, the better. Uh, so this is something that I would, uh, as I've said, I think it's step one, really. Um, so, and then the other thing is long term, we should be talking about what society is it that we want to emerge from you know, the the ashes of the Great Reset, um, assuming you know whatever. I'm, I'm using the Great Reset as the thing that it, maybe the Great Reset will not fail. Maybe people will live in pods for a while, but I I'm pretty sure that it will all mess up in the end. And we have to have you know even if you and I aren't there when it happens, even if you and I aren't there to rebuild the world, we do need to have at least in, uh, guided those who are there with ideas that they can use and uh, a template for a world that's worth living in. That's, yeah, it is really. It is it is a template for a world that's worth living in. That's a good way to put it. It's A lot of people find the current conditions intolerable. They can't exist inside their cage anymore. And that is at the basis of what we should be trying to sell people. Um, we've got a couple of donations in before we finish here. Uh, I missed one from uh, Falling Outside the Normal Moral Constraints. That's a very long name. Uh, donated $2 and said, Big love for woes and millennial. I think a lot of people enjoyed your millennial. That was a kind of a big return moment. Um, uh, JD, five, donating five pounds, saying, Working at an ad agency is basically, I have no mouth and I'm a scream. They all complain it's like Mad Men, but it was like that. It'd be paradise. I'm I'm sorry you have to work in advertising. That sounds miserable. Uh, do you have anything you'd like to shill before we finish, Money or Wells? Uh, well, just my, uh, my Telegram. That's where I'm most active. I'm also on Odyssey. I'm also on Gab. Uh, I've got my own website, millennialwoes.com. Millennial is two L's, two N's, and then another L. Everyone misspells that, so I have to tell people that. Um, I'm not just being you know, a pedantic, annoying twat. I'm, it's, I'm trying to help out there. Um, and what else? Yeah, I think that's about it. So, yeah, you can find me on... Uh, I'll put it in the chat, your Telegram link. Mm. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, there's also... Link tree. I can't. I'm never quite sure whether I've whether my link tree is still working. Let me just have a look. Uh, um, yeah, feel free to put it in one of the Discord chats yeah, here. We'll uh, we'll share you're, that. You're digging that up. I will thank both the people who uh, shared the stream. I know you shared it on your Telegram. Well, Charlemagne and Samuel Gog and he did as well. So because we've had quite the, the quite the uptick in numbers than we normally do. So hopefully some of the people who are new viewers might want to stick around. Uh, I will also say, because people caught the little audio blip earlier on, uh, you want to go watch something else, uh, Giant Geo and Prudentialist are launching their new series uh, this evening. So, go watch uh, that. Yes, we'll, <laughs> we'll go raid them, it's in the chat. Uh, tell, them, tell them Strump sent you. Um, we'll, uh, is that what you've linked there? I'll put a community post out there as well, and I will make sure... Oh, uh, there we go. We'll, we'll also make sure that... Um, your links get put in the description. Um, even even though we're, you have a larger internet presence than we do, with a, like I said, every interlink helps. Um, so I'll we'll, we'll try and make sure that stuff's down below if you're watching the VOD and don't have contact with Woes's community. Uh, again, thank you for coming on. Um, I hope well, I hope you, you weren't too me. fed posty. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, maybe I'm too paranoid about that stuff. I'm not sure. Uh, but thank you for inviting me on. I hope I haven't been too miserableist or black no, I, I really no, don't no, no. want it's, to be. It's, it's just been, that I'm aware of the dangers. You no, know, it's been an interesting conversation. I knew, I knew you wouldn't have the same perspective <clears throat> necessarily as us and some of the other people that are around us. So it's it's why I asked. And if anything, I look forward to having a maybe future conversations if the opportunity ever does arise. Yes. Yes. Indeed. Definitely. 
Well, thanks. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Not a problem. Thank yes. you for coming on. I, I suppose that's us done for the evening. So I'll say good night from me. Yes, and uh, good night from her. Um, we'll uh, thank you guys for coming. Thank you for turning up. Um, we'll see you guys again next week. Bye. Good night. Oh, there we go. We're off.